Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Hey, Elevate Church family, I am super excited about today's service. You know, here at Elevate Church, we value teamwork, and we have a lot of great people in our church, but we have three special people that are going to be bringing you the word today who have been growing in this house, and it's great to see people grow in their spiritual walk with God, but also just to hear them speak and the revelation that God speaks to them has been so amazing. So the first person I have today, her name is Sogo Pooley. She's our staff member, but she's also our volunteer director and she has such a great passion for this house and I promise you that when you hear her speak she speaks from the heart of the father she has also has a great family and three beautiful children so help me give it up for so gold pulley come on church just give it up what's up elevate chamily any excuse to be able to use that word right such a creative word Okay, bow your heads, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that we get to be here. I thank you, Father God, that you are preparing our hearts and our ears to receive the word. I pray that you speak through me and that every life in this room is changed forever. In Jesus' name, amen. So conveniently, if you take your phones out, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to our amazing Ticket to Heaven, the Elevate Church app, if you can... Just click on to that. We have our notes for the day so you guys can keep up with me and take some notes and then email it to yourself, print it, laminate it, stick it on the refrigerator, read it, read it, read it, meditate on it, be changed forever and ever and ever. So did you guys do that? Okay. So we're on this topic, thinkers, and, you know, it's like week 27 that we're on this topic, and, you know, I... As I was gathering my notes and thinking about, you know, to, to really understand the thought process and the mind and how it works. And, you know, we've, you know, Pastor Mauricio and Pastor Virginia week after week have just blowing, have been blowing my mind on thinkers. And so I was like, you know what, let's take this and let's do it from a neurological angle, okay? So today, yes, you came to church, but you also came to science class, <laughs> Um, so some really, really fun, interesting facts. These are things that you want to write down because they, you know, as I was studying and preparing and meditating, I was like, oh my gosh, I do all of this and that's why I am like that. So help me Jesus change. An average person has 30,000 thoughts run through their head in a day. 30,000 thoughts a day. 75% to 98% of mental and physical health comes from our thought life. 75 to 98% of our health comes from our thought life, which means, okay, so if you flip it around, 2 to 25% of our mental and physical health is caused by our environment and our genes. Genetically, you know, we're this way. And environment, it really just means, like, let's say I worked at a nuclear plant and I was there for years and there's something in the air and I breathed it and then 10 years later I got sick. So, but the, the part that's crazy to me, it's that it says 2 to 25% of our mental and our physical health is caused by our environment and our genes. So now, this basically means that you can no longer say, my grandma was this way, her mom was this way, that's why I'm this way. So you can really, up to 25%, you could really use that excuse. You can only pull that card for just a very short, um, very small percentage. Research shows, okay, this, so this is science and scripture. Research shows that our DNA actually changes shape in the response of our thoughts. So this is a DNA strand, okay. So when I have negative and toxic thinking, okay, this strand, which is my, which is my ge genetic make, it changes shape. So based on my thoughts, my negative and toxic thinking, this strand, it shrinks down and it tightens. Crazy, right? And then you wonder, why am I so tired? Why am I in this emotional funk? You have 30,000 thoughts run through your head in a day, and the majority of them are probably negative. These jeans don't look good on me. I don't really feel like going to work. Oh, my gosh, there's traffic, like all these things. Car show is happening. Should I go? Should I not go? Should I go? Should I not go? All these things are happening. And while that's happening, you're almost setting yourself up to be run down. You're almost setting your physical 
state to, to, to be exhausted, to be tired. So your DNA strand, it shortens and it tightens. But there's hope. Everybody say there's hope. So you can change your DNA shape back when you begin to have thoughts of love, of peace, and of joy. Isn't that amazing? Our creator was absolutely intentional. When God made us, he was so incredibly intentional in, in how he formed us. In the darkest places of our mother's womb, he didn't just like, bam, put me together. He was, he was crafty, he, bit by bit, piece by piece, and this is going to do that, and that's going to do that. Technically, I love this one, technically negative thinking leads to stress, which in effect our body's natural healing capabilities. So our body has natural healing capabilities. But when we constantly have negative and toxic thinking, it eliminates, it holds back, it withdraws. It, it doesn't allow our own bodies to heal itself. That's how amazing our creator is. Okay. Fear by itself or thoughts of having fear it trigger 1,400 1,400 physical or chemical illnesses. 1,400. Having thoughts of fear can create 1,400 physical and chemical illnesses. Toxic thinking, which is negative thinking, can cause the following. It's just a couple of things. Diabetes, cancer, asthma, skin problems, allergies. Do you want me to go on? Okay, that's, that's, that's it. That's like... It's basically telling you that when you have, have you ever met someone that's sick in body and they're super negative? It's like it comes hand in hand, right? Misery loves company. I'm sick in body and I happen to be negative. Actually, you're negative and you happen to be sick in body, right? Mind over matter. Your mind is the most, so God is the creator of the heavens and the universe. And after that, the most powerful thing is actually your brain. Your brain, if it can shape, if it can change the form of your DNA, there's an amazing doctor, find me later. Her name is Dr. Caroline Leaf. This is where I got most of my, my research from. She does this whole thing about when there's holes in your brain. Let's say someone gets into a traumatic car accident. There's holes in your brain, and they're like, oh, you know, the holes can never be recovered. But if you do this, like, 21-day brain detox, her book is amazing, you, and you start changing the way you think, and you start changing your patterns of negative thinking to positive thinking, your brain actually begins to shape back to the way it was, and the holes are, are restored. That is our creator. That, and that all comes from thinking. Isn't that amazing? 15 to 27 positive thoughts need to happen in order to eliminate one negative thought. 15 to 27. So your thoughts form your condition, and your thoughts produce your words, okay? So there is a, um, there's a French philosopher in the 1600s. His name is Rene Descartes. Uh, you can also, we'll do history class next week. And he, he basically came up with this thing that's, I think, therefore, I am. How many of you heard that saying before? So he's like, okay, if I'm a thinking being, that means I exist. If I, if, I, if I have the ability to think, that means I exist. And if you take it deeper, Solomon, okay, Solomon in Proverbs uh, 23, he says, a man, for as a man thinks in his heart, then so is he. So even Solomon says, whatever you think, that makes you. Okay, so I'm going to think, this is my thought, okay, and this thought, it makes me. This is what I become. This is what I am, okay? So my thoughts, they make me. If you go into the book of Matthew, Matthew 15, Jesus is talking to some Pharisees, and the Pharisees are like, hey, Jesus, you're like disciples. They're not really washing their hands, and that contaminates them. That defiles them. You know, how come they don't wash their hands like our elder brothers, like, you know, the people of the past did? And so Jesus is going back and forth, and he's trying to explain this uh, to, to, to the Pharisees and to the uh, disciples as well. And he basically sums it down because he's trying to explain to them, like, hey, it's not, you know, really sin that, that goes in. It's, it's sin that comes out. So if you can actually look at the scripture with me, it says, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come th from the heart, and these defile them. So he's ba basically saying what, uh, what comes out of your heart is what contaminates you. Contamination is toxicity. Toxicity is what? Those negative, toxic 
thinking that you have. So now it's saying my, what comes out of my mouth came from my heart. And then Solomon says, how I think in my heart makes me, right? And then over here, what I think becomes who I am, okay? So now, let's see who we are. In Genesis, if you want to go Old Testament with me, Genesis 1:47 it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image and likeness of God, he created him male and female. So now I am made in his image and his likeness. So now I am made like God. That's powerful. So God created the heavens and the universe, and then he created man. And when he created man, he said, hey, I want to make them just like me. I want to make them in my image and in my likeness. I want to make them like me. So let's see who God is. If you go into John, 1 John 4, 8, you can actually just write that scripture down. 1 John 4, 8. It says, God is love. Okay? So, lots, lots of going around, okay? So whatever comes out of your mouth comes from your heart. And Solomon says what comes from your heart, that's what makes you. Okay? So I'm going to think something and I'm going to become it. And now what am I? I am made in the image of God. I am made in his image and his likeness. So now who's God? God is love. Therefore, I am a love being. I was created for love. I was created to walk in love. I was created to speak of lovely things. I was created to put love in my heart. I was created to think of you as love, you as love, you as love, because God is love. And God made me in his image and in his likeness. Powerful, right? So, if you want to go to your app notes, this is a really good point that I want you to just really grasp if you're going to walk away with anything today. We are created in his image. He is love, therefore my design is love. My design is not fear, for I have not given you a spirit of fear, right, folks? But one of love, power, and a sound mind. Okay, so when God created me, he created me for love. When God created me, he, he created me so lovely. And, and uh, David says in Psalm 139, for you have fearfully and wonderfully made me. I was wonderfully created. You were wonderfully created. Our maker is so amazing. And our make is so amazing. Our design is amazing. My design is love. My de your design is love. So, do another recap. God, he made me. He is love. Therefore, I am love. Now, let's see what God calls me. And these are the things that you should be thinking of. This is how you should be thinking every day. You should not be thinking toxic thoughts. Toxic thoughts are going to keep you. They're going to delay you from a promise. They're going to hold you back from the truth. They're going to just ruin your day, ruin your relationships, ruin your destiny. All of it, It's just going to hold you back. It is so incredibly unproductive. Everybody say unproductive. And we all want to be productive beings, right? Because love is productive. Yes, love casts out a multitude of sins. Love changes the world. Love is outside Papusa fundraiser. Because we so love, we so love the children of God, even the ones that don't have in Oaxaca, Mexico. So this is what he says. He calls me. John 15, 15, he calls me friend. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, he calls me chosen. Ephesians 2, 10, he calls me his workmanship, his art. He says that I am handmade, that I am purposed and fashioned for good things. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he calls our bodies a temple, the residence of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 8, he says that we are his messengers of the world. Galatians 3, 26, he calls me his child. Romans 5, 8, he calls me greatly loved. John 8, 36, he says that we are free and we are free indeed. And my favorite, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he calls me brand new.
Come on, was that a great word? We are so proud of you, Sogol. Keep it up, girl. The next person is my favorite. I'm sorry, but she is. And it's my very own daughter, Alexis Ruiz. And let me tell you something. She is a part of our administration team, our worship team. And I just love seeing what God has been doing in my girl. And uh, today you get to hear from her. I know you're going to be encouraged. So help me give it up for Alexis Ruiz. Come on. You like that, huh? Just kidding. That's my daddy. All right. Okay, let me get myself started. You know, I love what Sogol said. She said, we are created in the image and the likeness of our God. But I ask you this, is that a core belief that we live on? Because what a core belief is, is basically what our thinking is made up of. It's our default. What are you going back to when things are getting tough? And so I have asked myself these questions. I'm definitely not holier than thou, so let's see if we relate here. Is it possible to think that what God says is true about me? Is it possible to think myself out of a situation that there is no hope in? Is it possible to bounce back and to live again when people mock you, when they mistreat you, when they judge you, when they betray you, or when you have done the betraying? Is it possible? And today I'm here to say yes, yes, it is possible. Anything is possible with our God. And there's a man in the Bible that have every right and valid reason to fall victim to his situation, to let every pain and setback affect the way he thought. But you know what he did? Instead, he chose to think, to set his heart and his mind on the promises of God. And that man is good old Joe, Joseph in the Bible. If you have not read it, I'm about to give you a snapshot. So read your Bible. Number two, go rent Disney's Joseph. So good. So good. All right, so a little background on little Joe. So Joseph is a son of Jacob and Rachel, right? Jacob was the son of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And he had 10 older brothers, and he was the young little bratty brother. And so here's a little snapshot of his life. So God's hand was always upon his family, but number one, he came from a dysfunctional family. His dad favored him over all his brothers, and his brothers hated his guts. And I get it because I have a little brother, and I'm like just... Ugh, sometimes, but his brothers hated him so much, though, that it went from hatred to, to betrayal. See, Joseph had something special that God had placed in him, and he was able to interpret dreams. He was able to have dreams, and they hated that. And so what happened? The brothers decide to betray him, and how they do that? They concocted a plan to put Joseph in a pit, throw him in the pit at 17 years of age, and leave him there. Tell the dad, your son is dead. Okay, that's, that's a lot of hate. And they decide to go even further. You know what? Let's just sell him into slavery. And so just imagine this, Joseph, 17 years old, in the pit, there's no hope. God is showing him all his dreams. He got a beautiful coat of many colors, and all of a sudden, he's right there. And there's been many moments, I'm sure, that each one of us have been right there in the pit where it's like there's no way out. But watch, because Joseph, he was so wise in how he thought. And so now we move. He's going into Egypt, right? He was sold into slavery. But when God's hand is upon you, God's hand is upon you. No one can touch you. And so he was favored by everyone. And he was actually put over the house in Potiphar's house, which was, um, Potiphar was a captain of the palace guard. So he was right up there with Pharaoh. And in this time, you know, he's having all this influence. But then all of a sudden, right, you get promoted. And then there's a little temptation. And there was a little loosey-goosey up in that house. And it was Potiphar's wife. Be like, no, I'll shut you down. You know what I mean? Anyways, so Potiphar's wife, Potiphar's wife was super into Joseph. And so every single day she would get on him like, you know, sleep with me, sleep with me, sleep with me. And Joseph would be like, no, 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 no. Until one day she grabbed his cloak, ripped it off of him, and he ran away. You need to be running away from temptation, people, not running to it. So watch yourselves. And what he did was listen to what he says. We're going to go to Jer uh, Gen Genesis 39.9. And it says, no one is greater in this house than I am. That's what he's saying to his uh, Potiphar's wife. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Notice this. His first thought is not, you know, will I get in trouble? What will Potiphar think if I just give her a little kiss on the cheek? He's, that's like not even his thoughts. His thought is, how can I sin against my God? Joseph, who has been betrayed, beat up, beat down, and he still wants to live for God, 
That is amazing, and it's possible. You see, Joseph is not some superhero. He's not some superman. These people in the Bible aren't fake. They're real, and they're just like us. And I said the first service, but we have good clothes. We're cute. So that was what's in was was in his heart. And so after that, unfortunately, you would think, I passed the test, but he gets wrongfully accused. He goes into prison. He meets two of uh, Pharaoh's servants, a cupbearer and a baker. They have this dream. Joseph interprets, right? God has already given him a gift. And he tells them, do not forget about me. And you know what these fools do? They forget about him. And Joseph's in prison for two more years. Two more years. It's like one thing after another. And you see, in those moments, Joseph could have chosen to just walk away from God, but he didn't. And that's where we're going to go to Deuteronomy 30, 19, because I believe this is what Joseph lived. And he said, this day, I call the heavens and the earth as witness against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. And every single time we live out this life until Jesus comes back, you will always be presented with two choices, life and death. There is no gray area. There is no wavering. Wavering actually puts you even more in the danger zone. Let your yes be yes. Choose life. God is with you. He is for you. He won't leave you. And so that's what Joseph did. And so I encourage you, if you're in a place where you have to make a decision, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And allow the Holy Spirit to lead you as you do that. And so Joseph didn't come to this conclusion overnight. No, it was day by day, moment by moment, when he was sitting there in the prison, nothing else to do. He chose every single day to keep his heart, to keep his mind right before God. And so later on, Pharaoh has this dream. No one can interpret it. And then, you know, little homie finally remembers. He's like, oh, I remember Joseph. And so Joseph comes out. He interprets the dream. And God, again, shows favor on his life. And so now he's put even in more charge. He's now the chief steward over Pharaoh's palace. So he's up there with him. And then you think, like, yay, everything's good. The story has already finished. But then his lovely brothers come back into his life because they need food. There's a famine going on during this time. And isn't it so funny how when you think you're doing so good after so many years and all of a sudden your past wants to pop up back up and it's like, I thought I dealt with you like 20 years ago or a year ago or even a week ago and it just keeps on coming up. But watch what he does. He forgives his brothers and he weeps with them. And this is what I want you to get today. Do not be afraid to face what has taken place in your life. I understand there's a difference between drama and trauma. But it doesn't matter what it is. You need to face what has taken place in your life. This doesn't mean you dwell in your past. But this means that you confront things. Do not suppress. Do not uh, repress your emotions, your thoughts, your feelings. Because God wants to take you on a journey of full healing, of full restoration. And that's what Joseph did. He allowed God in every single moment, in every single pitfall, to be with him so he could address his emotions. So he could address his feelings. So he could address his thinking. And this is what happens after that. So he forgives them, they weep, and then Pharaoh's like, you know what? Bring your family, give them the best of Egypt. And if we remember, Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, so that you and your children may live. Because when you make a choice, I'm telling you, it's a ripple effect for your generation. It's a ripple effect for your children, your children's children, your great-grandchildren. And for parents who are in here, it is so vital and it is so important to train up your child. They see what you're doing. They hear how you're talking. I'm literally like... A split between my mom and dad because I've been watching them ever since a child. And now I can confidently say by the grace of God that my brother and I love the Lord because we saw what they chose in their thinking. And so if it's not too late to choose that. And so restoration not only hit his family, but also there was great prosperity for them. And so the main point I want to tell you is you want, if you want to make it to the palace, the decision begins when you're in the pit. If you want to make it to your promise, your decision starts now when all hell is breaking loose. This is when it matters. This is when it counts. And our thoughts, just like Sogo said, literally change the makeup of our brain. It changes our DNA. And so why not change our thoughts to be back to its formal design, which was I'm created in the image of God and in his likeness. And I can do all things through Christ Jesus. And so we are overcomers who are not ashamed or afraid to face things and process things. 
And then the last scripture I want to leave with you is Genesis 50, 20, and it's my favorite. And it says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I love the scripture. I want to get it tattooed right here on my forehead because this is a scripture that we have scriptures my family and I stand on. But this is a scripture that I have chosen to stand on as a woman of the Lord. Because as me and my family are choosing to choose him and to think higher and to do whatever God has called us to do. It has come with so many pitfalls. It has come with so many battles. It has come with so many things where you feel like, God, why did you leave? But here's the deal. God has never left. So what I do is I look at whatever. I picture the devil. And I'm like, I look at him and I'm like, you intended to harm me. But God intended it to save many lives. And every single time I come to church on a Sunday, every single time I come to church on a Wednesday, every single time there's devoted, every single time there's Elevate Men, every single time there's Oaxaca Kids, every single time there's a fundraiser, I know that the saving of many lives is already taking place and there are so many more lives to take place. So I'm charging you today to be willing to change your thinking because there is such a great reward. You are only one thought away from your destiny. Wow. Can you all just say with me, wow, ready? One, two, three. Wow. Man, we have some phenomenal gift in this house. Now, the next person coming up is an amazing, incredible man of God. He's a part of our worship team. He's my personal assistant. And let me tell you something. This man has so much passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to help me give it up for our very own Pastor Anthony Stamps. Come on, church. Let's give it up. All right, all right. Well, listen, if you read in the book of Daniel and you read specifically chapters 1 through 6, for the sake of time, I won't go into that, but I want you guys to really go home and read uh, Daniel chapters 1 through 6. And here's why. In those chapters, you're going to find Daniel to be such a brilliant thinker, such a brilliant man. He was an individual who was thought of as the wisest in the land. Mind you, mind you, Daniel was a captive. In other words, he wasn't born in this land. At uh, this time, it was Babylon that, that captured uh, Daniel, ripped him away from all that he knew. But yet, he was considered at one point the wisest man in this land. He always hungered to grow in his knowledge. He always hungered to grow in understanding. He always desired more wisdom. However... As brilliant as Daniel was and as respected as he was, he challenged, he, he faced a challenge that seemed to never go away and never, and never minimized in his life. And, and I believe this is the challenge that we all face even to this day. And this challenge was that his identity and his culture and his faith in God was constantly being pressured to be stripped away from him. Constantly. When he was enslaved and captured by the, by the Babylonians, he was constantly being pressured to lose who he believed and he knew that he was. And that's a challenge that I believe, look, we, we face that no matter what your job is, no matter what your culture background is. But you're constantly being in a position where your identity is, is being pressured to be ripped away. Where your faith, all that you believe, all that you have learned, all that you have grown to know in God is constantly being under pressure to be stripped away. That's the society we're in today. But listen, but as challenged as Daniel was, as much as he faced this challenge, the one thing that separated him from everyone else was that his environment may have been chaotic on the outside. His environment may have been pressuring around him. Everything that surrounded him gave him every reason to quit and give up and, and, and surrender his identity. But yet it was, it was one thing that didn't have any kind of power over his mind. In fact, just the opposite Daniel's frame of mind is the very thing that influenced four kings to change the culture of that nation. It was the way he thought, it was the way he presented his thought that caused four kings who wanted, mind you, nothing to do with God. They were known as to be the most vile pagans of the land on the earth at this time. And he convinced, influenced, caused them to change their course of action, four kings, to not only make for their own decision to follow God, but get this, at the end of these chapters, what you'll start to see is that as the kings made their decrees across the land, as they changed their laws based on the influence of Daniel, 
he began to make laws, and this is what they would say. It would say, you are to bow down and worship the God that Daniel serves. When was the last time someone came to you and said, I want to worship the God that you serve? I want to get to know this God. You see, because Daniel, Daniel was captured. He wasn't any different from the rest of the people of Judah. He wasn't any different. What separated him was like Alexis was saying, he made a choice. He made a decision, and therefore, because of he thought, because of what he thought, therefore, he was. And so his frame of mind influenced the kings, influenced the nation. So if there's anything I want you guys to take away from these chapters, anything I want you to take back and, and really meditate on is this one thought, that your internal environment will shape your external environment. The very thing that was growing and 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 steadfast and firm on the inside of Daniel was the very thing that changed everything around him externally. It changed the way other people worship God. Those that were worshiping idols were now commanded to worship God. Your internal environment will shape your external environment. See, Daniel had built in and, and over the course of his life and over the course of his culture, he developed an environment within him. This environment consisted of his belief in God. It consisted of his loyalty to God. And it consisted of his faithfulness to want faithfully serve God. And so he developed this internal environment, this internal set of components that caused him to constantly think of God. His mind, his will, and emotions were centered around God internally. And it was his desire to honor this environment inside of him. He desired that, that everything that he knew to think, everything that he knew to believe would be the very thing that would create for him a pathway out of this slavery. And, and not necessarily take him literally out of slavery. Mind you, he was still a captured uh, a, a man of Judah. He was still encaptured by this town. But, but check this out. Because of his influence, it brought him up out of that, out of culturization. Now he had the freedom to worship God. Now he had the freedom to serve God. Now he had the freedom to do as he pleased for God because his internal environment has shaped the external environment. And in result, we see these kings change this nation. We see them uh, uh, start to develop this reverence for God. We see the kings start to even teach this reverence to their people of God now because of what Daniel decided to do on the inside. See, a lot of you step into environments where you're in a place where maybe, maybe you're at home and, listen, you're the only one that believes in God. You're the only one who decides to get up every Sunday morning and make it out to church, yet you face this struggle of leaving a home where maybe you leave and, and, and you feel a little guilty because they're not quite there. They don't quite see it the way you do. Maybe they don't know God. They haven't had the opportunity to know God. And so you're struggling. You're in this environment, this, in this culture where you almost seem like you're, you, you need to change a little bit to adapt so that they can relate to you. But listen, God didn't tell Daniel to adapt to his culture. Daniel made his culture adapt to him. Daniel made the extremities, the external environment adapt to what God had placed on the inside of him. And so the Bible warns us of, of, of falling into a place where you allow the culture to, uh, to adapt. You adapt to the culture. You allow the culture to shape you and mold you. The Bible warns us of it. But just as it warns us, it also provides us some knowledge on how to get out. And so I want to share that with you. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, listen to what it says. And I'm going to read this out of the message version because I think it's really awesome and it paints a really cool picture and it reminds me of Daniel. Check it out. It says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into. Don't get so well adjusted to it. Don't get comfortable. Don't sit back and accept it. Don't say, well, it is what it is. Well, I just have to. And don't fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed. Look, look at this. You'll be changed from the internal to the external. You'll be changed. In other words, what's the change that people will begin to see on the outside of you, that external environment, is because of the change that already happened internally. It's because of the decisions you already made to make these adjustments within your mind, within your will, within your emotions. And so you'll begin to be changed from the inside on out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture that's around you, 
right, always dragging you down, right? If you don't fit in, then you, you, you're not cool, you don't belong. If you can't follow the culture, you don't know what's up, you don't know what's going on. And listen, it's saying, look, readily recognize what he wants from you. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you. And he develops well-formed maturity in you. And so my question to, to all of us here today is how, how would we allow God to draw the best out of us if we're not willing to invest the best within us? And what I mean by that is God has given us tools. He's given us his word, which has not only painted a picture of how we need to live, but has given us uh, 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 escape routes out of falling victim to succumbing to the culture that we're surrounded by. And I believe that God has designed each and every person with the best in mind. And if he designed you with the best in mind, that means it's only up to us to now tap into that best and allow him to draw it out. See, at first it may seem a little immature. At first it may seem a little newbornish, for lack of a better word. It may seem a little like you're still trying to get a hold of how do I stand up as a Christian? How do I stand up in the middle of my environment? How do I stand up and stand out even though I know I look foolish at times, even though they may not even accept me what I have to say? How do I do that? How do I do that? You may also come up with a challenge to yourself like, you know what? Uh, to make it easier on myself, I'm going to create a wall. And I'm going to create a wall around myself and around the environment I'm in. But God never asked Daniel to create a wall in his environment. In fact, he was asked to be interjected into this environment. He was injected into the very DNA of the very thing that call themselves enemies of God. So we think we have it bad when we step into work and we hear crazy cuss words and we see all this wild behavior and we think we have it. This guy was enslaved and forced to worship idols, but yet he refused to let his internal environment be adjusted. And so I'm challenging you today, church. I'm challenging you that as we, as we continue on this week and we step out, you know, we've been hearing about this thinker series and how to think a little bit differently. And if we can only just think higher, think greater, I'm going to challenge you to think a little deeper today. And as you walk out of this place and you walk into an external environment of chaos, maybe it's in your home today, maybe it's at your workplace, maybe it's right outside these doors, but you're going to be faced with an environment that looks nothing like what's on the inside of you. But press on all the more, continue on all the more, and watch your internal environment begin to shape, begin to mold that external environment. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.